Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves, Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. Today on Uncommon Knowledge, the man who was once, and may one day be again, responsible for Her Majesty's Armed Forces, Member of Parliament and former Secretary of State for Defense, Liam Fox. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. The Member of Parliament for North Somerset, Liam Fox, served from 2010 to 2011 as Secretary of State for Defense, that is, the civilian who runs the British military just as the American Secretary of Defense runs ours. Today, he remains on every journalist's shortlist of those most likely to become one day leader of the Conservative or Tory party. Born and raised in Scotland, Liam Fox is also a medical doctor and the author of a book published this spring in the United States, Rising Tides, Facing the Challenges of a New Era. Dr. Liam Fox, welcome. Thank you. NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, NATO, signed in 1949. The treaty united Western Europe with the United States and Canada in promising that any attack on any NATO country would be seen by the rest as an attack on all. During the Cold War, the mission of NATO is perfectly straightforward. Defend Western Europe against the Soviet Union. But today, you, you speak often about the importance of sustaining NATO. Let me quote to you Henry Kissinger, not all that long ago. What is NATO trying to accomplish? What is the mission? I haven't thought through that proposition. That's Secretary of State Henry Kissinger talking about the lack of clarity for NATO today. What is the purpose for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization now? Well, if anyone was any doubt about the importance of, of Europe to wider regional and global security, President Putin's actions in the Ukraine has, has brought it home very clearly. And I think that NATO has the two roles that it's always had, the political role and the military role. Bob Gates, who, for whom I have the utmost respect, I think one of the... Whom, whom you interviewed for this book. Yes, he's a very good friend of mine. And one of the few things I think that we ever disagreed to any extent at all on was on the relative strength of the political and the military roles of NATO. I actually think that NATO functions not too badly as a military alliance and has done with in Afghanistan and, and Libya and so on. But I think it has lost its way in terms of a political alliance. I think it has forgotten what it's for. And I think that's because we don't talk about our values in the way that we used to. When we talked about the, the Cold War, it wasn't just about the defeat of the, the Soviet Union or stopping them rolling over Central Europe. It was also the defeat of communism. It was also to stop the ideology of communism from triumphing over capitalism and the free world. We need to remember the values upon which our alliance is based. And those, those values underpin or should underpin everything that we do. Um, I'll now ask questions very deliberately as an American. Wall Street Journal last month, quote, European powers in recent years have shelved entire divisions and weapon systems. The British Royal Navy doesn't operate a proper aircraft carrier. France and the UK each now field a mere 200 main battle tanks. The UK now has 174,000 armed forces, down from 308,000 in 1990. China has been expanding its military for more than a decade. The Soviets have been behaving aggressively since at least, nobody could doubt it, at least since their invasion of Georgia in 2008. Now comes the news as they move into the Crimea that the Russians are no longer operating with demoralized troops and clanky rusty old equipment. It turns out that the troops are well trained, the equipment is good, Vladimir Putin has built a modern military and Europe has progressively continued to shrink its armed forces. So here's what it comes to. In to. The one question I cannot resist asking, how can it be that Britannia no longer operates a single battle-ready aircraft carrier? Well, the actual program meant that the last one was going to be retiring in 2014, but the decisions taken by the previous government didn't get the new carriers built and up and running on time and having the new F-35s uh, on board. 
that will come. So they're coming. That comes later in the decade, and, and the Royal Navy gets built up in terms of its total surface fleet in the early 2020s. Uh, the decisions that we took when we came to office in, in 2010 were that we needed to see an increase in the size of the Royal Navy in the years ahead, and it needed to have a substantial upgrade. So out go the smaller, older carriers, in come the new 64,000 ton carriers capable of carrying the F-35s and providing the United States with a very important seagoing partner. Well, all right, so it's still the case that the United States spends, rough, right now we're at about 4.7% of GDP on defense. Britain, as best I can tell, is about 2.3, 2.4%. France is about 2.3, 2.4%. Here's the number that I could hardly believe when I came across it. Poland, which within living memory was overrun by the Germans from one direction and by the Russians from the other direction, Poland spends less than 2% of GDP on defense. And so the Americans look at this. Well, here, Irving Kristol used to say during the 1980s that NATO made sense right up until the mid-70s, because right up until the mid-70s, you could still argue that Europe was rebuilding after the war. But from that point on, they were as rich as we were, and there was a danger of infantilizing Europe in carrying them, in seeing to their own defense. So the American question, an American question would be, why, doesn't, why can't Europe spend what it needs to spend to defend itself properly? Well, you mentioned Britain and France, but uh, apart from the United States, um, there's only one other country in the whole of NATO, apart from the three of us, who actually make the 2% GDP spend. And that's, that's supposedly the floor, not the ceiling, right. in terms of what we spend. The, it is, it's, it's, it's an appalling situation that so few European countries are actually willing to spend what they need on their collective security. It's, it is a scandal. If, if I were uh, an American taxpayer, I would be asking some serious questions about how, wh why I was expected from my income to carry so much of European defence. Now, there are all sorts of different uh, currents going on in European thinking about mm. security. You've got the European Union trying to muscle in um, on NATO uh, with a lot of talk about um, parallel structures, I think they're duplicating structures, which will divert scarce resources even further away from the European contribution uh, to NATO. Uh, and I think that, th that you're absolutely correct, that, that this needs to be uh, a moment of truth for Europe. Now that we can see the Russians moving again, and, and, and this is not Soviet expansion, this is good old fashioned Russian imperialism mm -hmm. that we're seeing, uh, this needs to be a clear warning for European nations, and I think this needs to be a break with our relations with Russia in as far as we've known them. But when you mention Britain and France in terms of spending, Britain and France together now constitute more than 50% of all the defence spending for the whole European continent and 65% of research and development. Britain has, the, Britain has the sixth largest economy in the world, as I recall, and the fourth largest defence budget. So there's an argument that you're doing your bit. At the same time, can I just ask you about your period in office as Minister for Defence? Under Mrs. Thatcher and the first year or two of the major government, British defense spending was similar to American. That is, it was well over 4.5%. The Cold War ends, and then, and then it, beginning under John Major, it drops right down to well under 3% and has stayed there. Now, you just said a moment ago that one of your efforts was to add resources to the Royal Navy to increase the surface fleet. At the same time, you were responsible for, or during your time in office, you cut... 11,000 personnel from the armed forces. I believe the general proposal was to cut 17,000 and you whittled it down to an 11,000 cut. I'm not suggesting you're a cutter, but what was that? Is it the job of Tories? I guess what I'm asking is, why, do, why don't the conservatives make a cleaner break with the lib with, if Tony Blair built down defenses so dramatically, where's the sharp break? Where's the, where, are, where are the Tories saying, we need more, we need it quickly? Well, of course, the first thing to point out is it's not a Conservative government, it's a coalition government right. between the Conservatives and the Liberals. Um, and there are penalties for not winning elections and not being able to do what you want is number one uh, of the penalties. Uh, so that's, let's make that one clear. Uh, secondly, uh, the government's overwhelming strategic aim is to try to return to some semblance of fiscal conservatism. 
to try to eliminate our huge annual deficit and to get our, uh, our debts down as a country. When you talk about the actual numbers, we're spending uh, short of £40 billion on defence this year. Uh, we are spending £58 billion per year on debt interest mm. as a country. And you have to see long-term debt as a strategic issue. Countries that allow their debts to get way out of hand eventually are not able to spend money on the things that they actually want, even here in the United States. Look at the cuts that the Pentagon is having to make over the decade, while America is spending $450 billion a year in debt interest, much of it to countries such as Russia and China. Where's the irony? A decade from now, if the Tories win the next election, do you think you could get defense spending back up into the range of three, three and a half percent of GDP? I think defense budgets will have to rise across Europe now. I think they will have to rise in the face of the Russian threat that is now extremely clear. I think that uh, Western politicians in general allowed wishful thinking about Russia to take the place of critical analysis. It's now very clear that Russia is not going the direction of a liberal, liberal pluralist democracy in the way that many wanted. It is the same old Russia. Uh, when when uh, President uh, Bush looked into Putin's eyes and saw a good man, as they say, Putin looked into his and saw a KGB file number. Once KGB, always KGB, and that is exactly how he will behave. Two quotations, Liam, on Russia. Quotation one, British journalist Liam Halligan, writing this spring in the London Spectator, quote, even if Russia didn't supply a third of Europe's oil and gas, other commercial ties still bind. With great determination, many German firms have built lucrative Russian trading links over the last two decades. Even in the UK, mainstream opinion is steadily becoming more critical of our, inverted quote, uh, quote, quotation marks, new Cold War posturing, close quote. Europe is too commercially close to Russia to turn and oppose it. Quotation two, historian Paul Ray, writing this spring on Ricochet, the Russians, quote, will alienate all of their neighbors in Europe. They will persuade the Germans, the Italian, the French, and the British that their neighbors to the east, such, in po such as Poland and Estonia, are right, that Russia is a rogue power. This means that NATO will be rejuvenated and that the Europeans will once again look to the United States for leadership, close quote. Who's right? Um, I'm not sure that they're actually mutually exclusive because oh, I, think, really? I, right. think, I think that uh, I think that there is a shock going on. I think that you will now see uh, some of the countries you mentioned, Poland, for example, the Baltic states now seriously recognizing the threat that Russia poses to them, uh, which I'd, I'd like to come back to in just a second. Um, but there's also no doubt that it's true that countries, particularly Germany, are very, very closely linked industrially. Uh, and in terms of energy supply uh, to Russia. The deal that former Chancellor Schroeder did uh, put Germany um, very much with, with the Russian energy noose around its neck. And the policy then to abandon their civil nuclear energy program uh, was, ta in my view, tantamount to crazy. Um, so th there is a big problem there. It's not a problem that we in the United Kingdom actually face because we don't get any gas from Russia at all. Um, but it is an indirect problem because of the dependency of the European economy in general um, on the relationship with Russia. In terms of the military relationship, NATO has done the easy bit, which is stop military uh, cooperation with Russia. The really important part would be to stop industrial defence cooperation with Russia. And that becomes a big problem, particularly for France. But the reason... Now, explain that. To stop industrial military cooperation, I simply don't know what that term means. What are you getting in at? Terms of, uh, in terms of trading weapons, in terms of of selling weapons I or see. joint projects. I see. I see. How far does Vladimir Putin want to go? Or let me put it this way: If you were the Prime Minister of Estonia, or if you were someone who I think is your friend, Radek Sikorsky, the Foreign Minister in Poland, what are you thinking right now? I'm thinking that. Um, Putin has effectively driven a coach and horses through the concept of international law, namely that Russian ethnic uh, citizens are not protected by the laws or the government or the constitutions of the countries in which they live, but by an external power. If you allow that to stand in a country like Latvia in the Baltics, where there's a majority 
ethnic Russian population, what he is saying is the natural protector for those citizens it's not the government of Latvia, it's not the laws of the courts of Latvia or the democratic system of Latvia, it's Moscow. That is completely unacceptable because if you start to extrapolate and see what sort of world that takes us into, then that, that is a nightmare prospect. Does he want to annex bits of eastern Ukraine? Does he want Donetsk? Does he want all of Ukraine? What, what, what are his next couple of moves, do you reckon? Well, I think what he wanted was to stop the Ukraine moving economically towards the European Union. And as a result of trying to strong arm the Ukraine, we saw the situation uh, that ultimately erupted there. Uh, clearly, he's now not ever going to achieve the aim of alienating the Ukraine from Western Europe, which will, is, if you like, a strategic defeat. But he will achieve his aim um, of, of strengthening the Russian hand uh, in the Ukraine, in the Crimea, where they've got their only warm water port. But also, uh, he is sending a clear message to NATO um, that uh, Russia, in areas that it regards as its near abroad, will reserve the right to act militarily. We've seen it in Georgia, and we, we did nothing in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear still I was in Washington recently and people were saying, well, Putin is misreading the signals. Putin is not misreading the signals. Putin is perfectly reading the signals. He understood what it was when we did nothing about the red lines in Syria. He understood the West inactivity over Georgia when the Ukraine was being blackmailed with gas supplies and costs. In all these things, we did nothing. And he understood perfectly what that allowed him to do. Now we need a rethink. This has to be not the suspension of the G8. This is to be the end of the G8. It is not possible, in my view, to cooperate with Russia in the way that we had intended or foreseen as long as the current Russian behavior continues. And when it comes to the, the continuing situation in, in a place like Georgia, uh, I was complaining as Secretary of State for Defense that in, in London, we weren't calling it an occupation. Well, if you've got foreign troops having bases on your sovereign soil and they refuse to leave. That's an occupation. That's an occupation in my dictionary. Yeah. Radical Islam, you voted in favor of the 2003 invasion of Iraq in which Britain joined the United States. If you knew then what we know now, how long it would take, what the price would be, estimates 100,000 or more Iraqis dead, you suffered terrible casualties in combat, so did we. The political fallout, the bitterness that it introduced to British politics and American politics, if you knew all of that, would you still have voted in favor of the Iraq invasion? In medicine, we have a saying which is that the most useful instrument is a retrospectoscope. <laughs> and uh, that also, uh, I think, holds in politics. Um, would I have been in favor of the initial decision? Probably. I think in retrospect, however, how we went about the immediate post-conflict period is the one that I think history will look back on in, in terms of our biggest mistakes, the debathification, uh, leaving hundreds of thousands of young men on the streets with no clear role but plenty of weapons, I think was a recipe for trouble. We clearly carried out the military elements uh, of the Iraq campaign very successfully and very swiftly. I think that it was the reconstruction um, that was fatally flawed. And I think that uh, when we look back, there are not very many uh, post-conflict scenarios where we have done better than we've had, than we've done in the initial conflict. Maybe you have to look right back to German post-war reconstruction to see uh, where we've been very successful uh, in a political reconstruction. Iran, let me quote Rising Tides. One of the most important factors may not be the military capability to stop Iran's leaders from developing a nuclear weapon, but the willingness of democratic governments to continue to bear the enormous economic costs of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. The lack of an appetite to do so might easily be seen in Tehran as weakness. We're already out of Iraq, and as we've mentioned, President Obama wants to get out of Afghanistan as quickly as possible. Will Iran build a bomb? That is a question that I simply am unable to answer because Iran may get very close to the ability to actually uh, weaponize its civil nuclear program and stop there. 
Um, Keep the components on the shelf, so to speak. Exactly, in, in, in a way that, that wouldn't be dissimilar to the Japanese position, for example. Um, that, that may be where we end up. It's very difficult to That would be acceptable? Say. Well, I don't think that we would have very much option uh, but to accept that in, in the real world. Here is where I think we don't know the answer to the question, and that is how much the new Iranian president is speaking with the authority of the supreme leader. We have examples in Iran in recent history of where they did make a fundamental change in policy. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini during the Iran-Iraq war deciding that he couldn't win, there was no one going to win, and he had what he described as his cup of poison moment uh, where he effectively brought it to an end. Uh, are we seeing that or something similar happening at the moment? Has uh, the effect of sanctions been so uh, unpleasant to the Iranian leadership that they've decided that they cannot continue on that direction, that they need to compromise now with the international community? Maybe, but I think it's too early to answer your question yet. The willingness, again that phrase, the willingness of democratic governments to bear the enormous cost. When it comes to it, again I go back to this figure of Poland spending less than 2% of GDP on defense. When it comes to it, is the West simply suffering from civilizational exhaustion, radical Islam, resurgent Russia. You said Vladimir Putin is reading the signals just exactly right. He's looking across his border at a Western Europe that would rather be comfortable than realistic perhaps. China's rising. Are we up to the fight? Are we one up of to my, the fight? One of my colleagues at a NATO meeting, I won't uh, mention the European country, said that uh, I think that uh, our national character is better suited to peacekeeping, to which I pointed out that you can only keep the peace if there's a peace to be kept. And sometimes to get the peace, you have to be willing to fight or to die for it. And here I think is, is the real crux of, of the argument. It's not whether we have the capability in the West to do what needs to be done in terms of our own security. I think the real question lies in our political will to do so. And in the book I talked about a conversation I had with a, a Frenchman, a French yes. official. And I said, why was it that in the Cold War we were willing to use the word better, that capitalism was better than communism, that liberty was better than tyranny? But nowadays we're not. Why is it when faced with fundamental Islamist ideas we're not willing to say better? Surely our beliefs that human rights apply across gender, race and religion are better than the alternatives. Surely giving women an equal say in society is better than oppression. And the answer was disappointing because the answer said, well actually nowadays it's too difficult to say better. It's just different. Well if we only think that the values that have made us who we are are just different and not better. Then it's lost then how can we persuade anybody else that our values are better? It is our own lack of self-belief that is the greatest threat that we face, not any enemy in any country on the globe. The sceptered isle. If I may, a few questions about aspects of British politics that are hard for, I was about to say hard for Americans, hard for this American to grasp. Liam Fox, in an interview this past March, quote, I am not a supporter of the European Union at all, close quote. Then why don't you leave the Tory party to become a member of UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, whose entire purpose for existence is to withdraw Britain from the European Union? Because I'm Have quite, it out, Liam, have it out. Because I'm quite happy to have the relationship with the European Union we originally voted for, which was an economic union. Um, what the British people have never given their assent to is a political union, which is what we now have, which is uh, involving itself in whole areas of our national life, in the workplace, in social legislation, even in foreign and security policy, places where we never gave our permission for it to go as an electorate. Uh, and that's why the Conservative Party, uh, unlike our coalition partners, uh, promises a referendum if we win the election in, in 2015, a genuine chance for the British people to say whether they want this to be the relationship they have or not. My real problem with the European Union, in uh, common with very many of my colleagues and countrymen, 
uh, are three words, ever closer union. It is those three words in the preamble to the Treaty of Rome that I have a problem with, because to me, the logical consequence and the end point of ever closer union is union, and I don't want that. Prime Minister Cameron, other leaders of the Conservative Party, remain committed to membership in the European Union even though polls show that over 50% of the public would vote to withdraw. Margaret Thatcher, the greatest Conservative politician of the last half century, by her final years in office had become pretty unambiguously skeptical, a Eurosceptic. Gay marriage, I mentioned a second issue. Prime Minister Cameron insisted on moving a vote through the House that passed with much more solid labor than conservative support, a measure that would have been, I think it's fair to say, unthinkable to Mrs. Thatcher. How did the Tory party go from representing the good, ordinary people of middle England under Mrs. Thatcher to representing urban professionals under, under David Cameron. Well, the Tory party has always been a broad church and it always has evolved. The reason it's the single most successful political party in the Western world is that it has evolved. I didn't support the gay marriage vote because uh, I felt it was unnecessary. Uh, and the place, country was not clamoring for that as best I could tell. The country was not clamoring for it. As far as I could see, the gay community wasn't clamoring for it either. We had introduced the concept of civil partnerships, which had worked very well. And the reason that I didn't support the gay marriage uh, proposal was that I thought the civil partnership uh, arrangements had actually dealt very well with uh, perceived and genuine discrimination uh, in many of the rules and laws that we had in the United Kingdom. But that civil partnership legislation only affected those involved. The gay marriage uh, legislation effectively redefined marriage for everybody. And that was what I thought was disproportionate. That's what I thought was unconservative about it which is why I voted against it. Um, it's, it's not an issue that seems to particularly bother the electorate uh, one way or another, certainly not in the same way that Europe is uh, a very defining issue for the electorate, not least because of the immigration implications. This September, your fellow Scots will vote on a referendum on independence, possibly becoming an independent country for the first time since the Act of Union in 1707. Does the Scot in Dr. Liam Fox support independence for Scotland? Well, absolutely not. Not? No, not a, not, a, not a micro percent of me supports independence. There's no sentimental, even after a, a whiskey or two, there's nothing, no. You don't want to break out the haggis and sing old Lang Syne and nothing. I'm a unionist. Um, and of course, um, I'm Scottish. I'm very proud of my Scottishness. Uh, most of my family still live there. Um, but we are uh, a very different union than we were in 1707. In 1707, we were a union of treaty. Now we're a union of people. The country has grown together. It's very difficult to find people in different parts of the United Kingdom who don't have grandparents or great-grandparents from another part of the United Kingdom. It's very hard uh, to find families where family members don't work in different parts of the United Kingdom. 800,000 first-generation Scots live in England. Uh, and incidentally will be denied a vote in the Scottish referendum, um, uh, which makes me think it's a lot more about the Scottish state than the Scottish people. Um, but let's not go there. But what, I, what makes me really angry is the fact that our families could become foreigners in their own country. Um, and why? For the sake of the political ambitions of a few Scottish politicians. I don't see why our families should be torn apart. All right. The next general election will take place in the United Kingdom just about a year from now. And for more than two years now, as best I can tell by Googling around on polling data, Labour has consistently led the Tories in all the polls by between three and eight points. If Labour wins, the next Prime Minister will be Ed Miliband, perhaps the most committed leftist among major British politicians since Michael Foote, certainly since Neil Kinnock. Conservative Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher moves the whole country toward greater freedom, smaller government. And then along comes Tony Blair and he ratifies Mrs. Thatcher's program. He spends too much, but he ratifies her program by keeping the market at the center of his policies. And after all these accomplishments, you face the prospect of Prime Minister Miliband. How can this be? I think he will probably be upholding the great traditions of, of Michael Foote and Neil Kinnock <laughs> by, by losing, by losing uh, <laughs> to us in general elections. I think that um, 
what is interesting, just if we look at the polling figures and without looking at the wider politics, uh, we've seen some bouncing around, around in the polls. Labour's lead was down to between one and three points only a month or so ago. In, in Britain, the traditional pattern is that governments recover in the final year, oppositions drop back. We were 13 points ahead a year before the last election and we just scraped in. Uh, so a lead of 3% wouldn't be tremendous. Tony Blair was 29 points ahead with a year to go in 1997. So and that doesn't bother me uh, disproportionately. What does bother me um, is what Tony Blair really did leave behind, which was not the rather rosy uh, picture that you suggest. Uh, it was an open door immigration policy. It was a massive running up of the public debts, uh, which we are still desperately trying to get to grips with. A massive expansion of the welfare state uh, and of uh, welfare dependency uh, in the country. All of these things are very difficult to reverse. And of course, they leave behind a sitting electorate where people, where a group of the electorate will say, how tempting to have it back, mm. where we can get money for nothing. The current Conservative government, the, the coalition government, has been reversing the welfare dependency as quickly as we can. For example, we've placed a welfare cap on each household, so there is a limit that any household can get on state handouts. And that has turned out to be one of our most popular policies because it means you cannot get more money not going to work than average hard-working people can get. Liam, last couple of questions. To quote once again from Rising Tides, you interviewed a number of figures, friends of yours, for this book. One of them is Condoleezza Rice, who said, the world doesn't feel very multipolar to me, to Condoleezza Rice, at all. Only the United States, the Brits, the Australians, and occasionally the French have any notion of global responsibility. The Chinese have none. It is a totally mercantilist foreign policy. Russia." is now mainly a blocking power. Show me another power that is willing to shoulder the responsibility that comes with global leadership. America, Britain, Australia, every so often the French, but fundamentally, it's the Anglosphere. It's the countries that have inherited the British tradition. Do you believe that as implicitly as your friend Condi Rice? I do. And uh, I think it was rather cruel to leave out Canada. Uh, she did leave um, out. And Canada, I'm sure she'd rewrite it if she could. And, uh, and, and Canada does play a, a very major role. Uh, it played a very major role in Afghanistan. It plays a major role but once in you start, NATO. Now you have to include New Zealand as well. Or, right, go ahead. Point taken. The, um, and, uh, but I think, I think that is essentially true. I think there needs to be a reawakening in, in Europe, as we discussed earlier, about the values that need to be defended. Some of the countries uh, in Poland, some of the other former East European countries um, who lived under the Soviet yoke need to recognize that peace and security are not a natural state of affairs. Mm -hmm. Chaos and disorder is the natural state of affairs. If we want to keep what we have achieved in recent decades, we're going to have to fight afresh for them. In fact, every new generation has to fight for them as the one before did. And I think that this is a key test of Western leadership. The countries that you mention need now to take their arguments to our partners who are underperforming. We also need to ask about the constitutional role of Japan and Germany in the new world order with, when countries are uh, taking great advantage of the economic opportunities of globalization, should they be contributing more to the global security environment? These are quite big questions because they will uh, force us to question the post-World War II assumptions, uh, which we've, we've held up till now. The special relationship, this is the phrase that Winston Churchill introduced in 1946. All phrases, of course, originate with Winston Churchill. Churchill and Roosevelt, Macmillan and Kennedy, Thatcher and Reagan, of course, Blair and Bush, that special relationship has remained special until perhaps the present. Obama and Cameron, uh, Obama's successor and Miliband. Has the special relationship run its course? No, but it does depend what you mean by the special relationship. When Churchill introduced that phrase in his great speech at 
Fulton, Missouri, which of course is better remembered for the, for the Iron Curtain, uh, he was speaking as a wartime leader. He understood what uh, cooperation could mean in terms of intelligence, military planning, joint exercising, and so on. Uh, I think, especially in the Reagan-Thatcher years, which might be seen as the high point of the special relationship, uh, I think it's allowed, it, has, it has allowed itself to take on a sort of dewy-eyed Disney-esque hue, uh, which was never really Churchill's intention. And Every time when, I try to get sentimental, you slap me down. I know, I'm just when, a terrible, unsentimental Brit. The, um, and, uh, I, I think, but I think that but what's important about it is that at the core, it is still an intelligence relationship. The intelligence sharing between the United States and the United Kingdom is unparalleled in the world. That is absolutely key, which is why it's very important that we maintain the legal frameworks that, that guarantee uh, that security relationship. But I think it is still there. The relationship between prime ministers has been rocky before. Harold Wilson wasn't exactly a close friend uh, of the White House. But the special relationship in terms of its, its uh, intelligence core function is too important to be left to the personal chemistry between any leaders or to be owned by any particular political parties on either side of the Atlantic. Final question, Liam. During the 1980s, we've talked about Mrs. Thatcher and, and uh, Reagan. The, the role Mrs. Thatcher played was unique and, in my judgment, indispensable. On the one hand, she refused to permit the Europeans, Mitterrand, Kohl, Trudeau, for these purposes, counts as a European, to write off the Americans as cowboys. And yet, at the same time, she refused to permit her friend Ronald Reagan to dismiss the Europeans as elitist or decadent or tired. She commands the respect of both sides. She's the honest broker who holds the alliance together at a critical moment in history. Well, that's a quarter of a century ago. What is the, or what should be, the distinctive role of Britain today? Britain should be what it has traditionally been at its best, an outward-looking, globalized nation willing to try to take advantage where it can of global economic circumstances and at the same time being willing to further its own values wherever it can around the globe. I very often hear these arguments that it's not any of our business to export ideas of democracy or rule of law or free markets to other parts of the world. You know, it's to our advantage in the long term that we do so, because those countries who benefit from all those things are likely to be more stable, more secure, and more prosperous. That ultimately helps us. And I simply have no time for the imposters of isolationism or protectionism, voices that I hear being raised once again in the United States they promised false dawns before, and that's all they're promising now. And those of us who believe in the things that have made us who we are need to keep believing on both sides of the Atlantic. We together kept the candle burning before. It looks as though we might have to do it again. Liam Fox, Member of Parliament and author of Rising Tides, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.